just you can write in the the VC text chat. Uh, how much generally would you say you know about the organ? Everyone, just just give a, a brief little uh, epithet. Just so I can gauge, because I don't want to, I don't want to go over the dummy basics. Have you sit there all bored? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh dear! Great. Well, for those of you who've just joined, uh, I've asked people to write. Uh, just very general, um, their level of understanding of the organ. That'll give me a good place to start. Ooh, fun. Hop in VC. Where are those other text channels? Okay, great. Oh, that looks like everyone. Great. So I guess we can start now. And uh, I think there wouldn't be a, a better way to start than to uh, perhaps uh, use a couple of excerpts and paraphrases uh, to give a general idea of the scope of this instrument. Now, what I'm going to start off with today is a sample set of an Austrian sort of uh, eclectic organ. Now, uh, beginning from the basics, um, you have two kinds of pipes in an organ. Uh, the first fundamental concept is that there are flue pipes and reed pipes, um, as well as, well, I think this is obvious, but every single note in the instrument has its own pipe. One pipe is only capable of producing one pitch at one volume at one timbre. So that's why you have so many, because it's such an inefficient way of, of making sound. Um, you need a lot of pipes. So the two kinds of pipes, the flue pipes, are the ones that you know and love as, as organ pipes. In fact, uh, if I jump over here, the, the ones you see in the facade there in the stream, and that's, that's this organ in real life, um, those are called flue pipes, and those are the um, facade pipes. Most of the time, those pipes don't actually speak. A lot of the pipe work is located behind those, and uh, they come in many different shapes and sizes. Now, I don't really have a picture of a reed pipe on hand, but they're, they're very different. They don't have a little uh, mouth, as it were, a, a slit on the front of the pipe. It's more like uh, a cone. Oh. It's more like a cone, and, and that cone is called the resonator, and it's attached to uh, a boot. And in that, you have this little piece of metal, the reed, that is beating against another uh, piece of metal, like a shallot. So if you think of how a clarinet works, it's, it's kind of like that, a clarinet or a saxophone. So... Uh, you have those kinds of reed pipes that produce a very, very unique timbre, and then the flue pipes. Uh, so those are the most basic categorizations of a, of a pipe. And I'll show you here, we have the basically exemplary example of a flue pipe, the flute, which... Um, and then we get reed pipes like the trompeta. And that, uh, you can clearly tell, has a much different timbre, much different character. And so you have... It's a lot brassier, it's a lot brighter. Um, and the way that sound is produced is different there. Um, you have a reed, a piece of metal vibrating against a shallot, and then you have air which is being vibrated by, uh, basically, it's, it works the same way as a flute. It, the air is being separated by a, a little piece called the, the upper lip. Uh, so you have, so uh, let me go a little bit more into depth about the different kinds of pipes. So uh, I think the most important thing to understand before you get into all of the different you know, machinations and, and technical things and, and terms for the, how to operate the organ is to understand what you are really operating. So you have different to tones of family, essentially. And as I told you, there's different classifications 
of pipes, you have two. You have reeds and you have flues. However, within those two classifications, you have more in uh, essentially what is four tones of family. You have the principal or foundational tones of family, uh, such as the eight-foot principal, or sometimes known as diapason on English or American organs. Uh, and that's a sort of... That's the sort of typical sound that one would associate with an organ. And uh, then you have, as I showed you earlier, you have all kinds of flutes. That's a bit more round, a bit more smooth. And this one has, it's a bit bolder. It has a little bit more of that uh, harmonic in it, which is the, um, it's a 15th above. And you hear that overtone quite clearly. Uh, as I like to say, a doot flute. Doot, 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 doot. Because uh, it makes a dute sound. And then you have another kind of, of stop, or sorry, uh, fat tone of family, which is the strings. And the strings are what I have to say, they're my favorite, absolute favorite kind of stop. And let me, since we're only focusing on the left jam here, um, here I have drawn a gamba. And this is used um, as a foundation stop, but it, what, what it really is, is it, it's a string. So... And you have that very, it's a sort of, it has a grainy tone. And the way that these pipes are built is they're actually a lot skinnier than the principal or flute pipes. And these pipes are made usually most of the time out of zinc. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of 70% zinc, while the principal pipes, or the pipes that you normally associate with an organ, um, the ones in the front that you see, those are most of the time 80 to 90% tin, so, so that they have that beautiful shine and polish. However, the ones on the inside usually aren't polished, and uh, they're made more of like a 60-40 mixture of tin and lead, and that, that affects the tone as well as, it's a very soft metal. Um, and so that's what the principles are made out of, and they have a, a sort of regular diameter. But these, these uh, string pipes, they're very skinny, so that's what gives them that stringy tone. And the beautiful thing about strings is they actually, they have their own, uh, their own little partner. And jumping over here to the swell, we have the native string up here, which is a viola. That same tone, that same sort of stringy. Uh, the thing is, it doesn't really sound anything like strings, um, ironically, uh, but they, we call them strings. And the beautiful thing about this is they have a matching set of pipes, usually in most organs, that is just a little bit out of tune with those, uh, with, with, with that in tune rank of pipes. And I, I, I'm saying rank, all that means is a set of pipes. You have a, a 61 notes in a keyboard, and each and every single note in that keyboard uh, needs to have its own individual pipe. So in that essence, you essentially need 61 pipes for every kind of tone that you want. And a rank can be 61 pipes or it can be more. Um, most of the time it's just 61 or 56. Uh, but when you get to pedal stops, it can actually be uh, classified as something closer to 27 or 32, uh, depending on how many notes you have in your pedal board. However, you have, um, back, back to the topic of strings, we have this rank that is slightly out of tune. So if I play, if I play a C major chord there, if you can hear that, and I'll play a, a, a C major chord on this uh, Celeste, as it were. Hear how that's just a little bit sharp? Well, when you put the two together, it's an absolutely magical effect. So here I'm going to add the strings. There's the Celeste. And so it gives it that shimmer. Um, that warmth, that really lushness. And so we, we, we love to use that a lot. And this is what is known as a uh, two rank string celeste because you have two, um, two sets of pipes that are playing for every note you hit. If I were to hit a C, I have one pipe which is sounding. 
And if I were to add the Celeste, which is another pipe at the same pitch, except it's a little bit sharp. Now, when I hit that same C, two pipes are essentially being played. So that's how we can play so many thousands of pipes with only 10 fingers. Um, it's not, uh, and it's not, it's not about playing all the notes. It's about strategically um, inputting and, 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 and organizing all of these different tonal resources, which have been organized in this fairly straightforward and mathematical way. And when you know how to use these stops, for example, you know the, vi the viola celeste goes with the viola, it can be magical. So it's all about knowing which sounds you really want and knowing what the sounds are, which uh, is a problem because every organ does not look like this. Every organ is in fact completely different um, and unique in its own right. There are tropes which can be observed and they're helpful for people when they're moving from instrument to instrument. But the truth of the matter is each instrument is completely unique in its own way and the organist actually has to accommodate for the specific tonal resources of that instrument every single time they play it. Um, and not only just, you know, the kinds of pipes they have, uh, but all the different features and functions that uh, typical organs would have. So, you know, a modern American instrument is going to have a lot more capabilities um, digitally than an instrument built, say, uh, in the 1750s, something that Bach would have played. And I'll explain why a little bit later on. Uh, and we have here, this is, this is what is known as the swell. We have different divisions in the instrument. And before I, before I get into divisions, uh, I'd actually just like to talk more. I'm pretty sure all of you are wondering, well, that's a lot of different names and, and knobs, uh, which is a lot of people compare it to the um, console of a spaceship or an airplane, uh, especially when you see the whole thing in its, uh, in its entirety. But it's really, really simple once you understand the different classifications of stops. And they fall into a couple of different things, depending on what kind of an instrument you have. But the, all the possible classifications. So we're, we're, you're going in another, another level here. We already have, OK, flue pipes, which make sound by using wind to uh, breaking it against an upper lip like a recorder. And we have reeds, which make sound more like a clarinet would. And within that, we have these four tones of family, which are, as I explained, strings, flutes, principles, and as well, reeds, obviously. That's a tone of family in there. And we have, so we have those four classifications. We have principles, strings, flutes, and reeds. But then we have more classifications of the kinds of stops that you can find on an organ. And the first one begins with foundation stops. Now, this includes uh, principles such as here. I'm pulling, I'm pulling that principle there. And as well as, as principles, you have flutes. Flutes also count. Flutes also count as foundation. And the reason for that is because they add a lot of body to an existing, an existing uh, principal stop. So that has a lot of um, overtones. The flute is a little bit more pure and it adds a little bit more body foundationally to the sound. So we classify those as foundation stops. And these stops don't come at, um, at one pitch, essentially. The way that organs are made and the reason why they have such a big range is because these kinds of pipes, I've been playing them all at eight foot pitch, as it were, that's basically concert pitch. If you were to pull an eight foot stop on an organ and hit middle C, that would be the same note as if you were to go to a piano and hit middle C. So the, the way that we get extended range with limited amount of keys, we have 61 keys, yet our range is probably twice that of the piano. And the reason for that is because we, we not only have the principal sound, this sound, at eight foot pitch, and, and all that means really is that the lowest C, that's, that pipe is eight feet long. That's all we mean to say by that. And if you do some simple, you know, uh, I'm sure all of you have studied up on your uh, Pythagorean math. Um, if you take a chord and you strike it, 
it'll it'll or pluck it it'll it'll create a tone and if you cut it in half it'll move up an octave so use these ratios different sizes of pipes and we we can have the principal at four feet and all that means is that this is four feet long the, the lowest c and i'll actually show you the console here i'm hitting the very low c on that keyboard and now here I'm hitting the low C. They're, they're an octave apart. And if I were actually to, that is also four foot. That pipe is four feet long. And this one, that one's two. This one's one. That one's half. And that one's a quarter. Uh, they have pipes that uh, go all the way down to the size of a, uh, a, the eraser on a pencil. Um, tiny, like, tiny little thing. Very, very high pitched. Um, but you have, you can have eight, and you can also have four, which sounds the same pitch, but at an octave higher. And if you combine the two, you essentially can get octaves by playing one note. And that's what contributes to the richness of the sound, is when you're playing, you know, maybe five notes in a chord, you're actually playing 10 pipes. So you have that extra addition um, to to everything you're, you're, you're playing. So that's a lot brighter and a lot, you know, uh, it's more full than having something down at that register. It's a bit darker. And then the same applies not only for going up, if we go up, we have two foot stops so the low C there is two feet long. That pipe is two feet long. And we also have, uh, as it were, 16 foot stops. And those sound at an octave lower than if you were to hit the, the key on the piano. So here, this, you can't hear that because it's, it's a bit too low probably for Discord. Um, but that, that's, that's sounding a C at an octave lower than if you were to go to a piano and hit middle C. Um, I should probably check if we have any questions so far. I know I've, it's quite a lot. Oh, are we recording it? Tubes with air. Yes. Okay, great. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, Jesse. Yes, a stop does. Essentially, all, that do, all that's doing is it stops the air from getting into that set of pipes. Yes. So, and, and you're saying that the audio is coming through okay? It's great. Um, so we have, so does, does everyone understand the concept of having a stop at 16 foot pitch, eight foot pitch, four foot pitch, and two foot pitch? Yeah, great. So if you combine all of them, you get what is called a chorus uh, in, in the pipe organ world. We have choruses. So you get an eight foot stop. If you add a four foot, add a two foot, and this is still, I'm hitting the same note. Uh, and then you add the 16. Uh, and then you get all these, uh, let's see. Where, oh, blue nicks. Uh, yes, all the facade pipes are, okay, well, sometimes the largest pipes, usually they are functional, but the smaller ones, yes, they are completely just for show. Um, air pressure being limited from too many or too strong from fewer stops. Now, okay, that's a good question. That's a little bit ahead. Oh, yes, I'll explain those. Those are what is called mutations. Um, and, and a lot of small pipes at the front don't actually, yes, they don't actually play. Um, oh, most, most, on most organs, those pipes are just for show. Um, now, I'll address Jesse's questions. <laughs> well, not really. There's still thousands of pipes behind them. Uh, and they're, they're all much more interestingly shaped, uh, if, if, I, if I can pull up some pictures. Um, however, air pressure used to be an issue, seeing as, you know, we've got our air pressure from manual pumping. Uh, but nowadays, we have these uh, things called reservoirs, and I'm not sure I can show them, uh, but those essentially make sure that the air pressure is constant uh, within the chests. Um, the way that pipe organs work is you have these sets of pipes that are set on individual chests. They're called wind chests. 
And these wind chests, they're all pressurized with air. And um, usually you have one set of pipes, a rank, to its own dedicated chest. And you have these reservoirs which maintain a constant pressure so that that way you don't have, for example, the tiny little flute, uh, of course, uh, get air deducted by it, when you pull on the big, ginormous Anshamad trumpets, which take up a lot of air. Usually those actually are on a separate wind supply. The stops that have larger uh, requirements for air, you have them on separate chests using separate reservoirs so that they don't take, uh, take up air or steal air from other parts of the organ. So that's how we uh, counteract that. In fact, this, this, uh, this software actually is a really great feature. I can turn off the blower and I can show you what happens when uh, pipes lose air pressure. Actually, I'm not sure if I have that enabled for this. Uh... Let's see. Yeah, I don't think I have it enabled. Uh... But uh, I'll go to another organ, and uh, you can actually turn off the blower, and it will model the, uh, how, how each of the ranks takes wind from each other. And in that case, when you don't have any air pressure, then the pipes do start stealing air. Um, oh. hmm, I wonder what that was. Uh, but you have... Fun fact, a little ligetti. Ah, okay, so on the, continuing on our classifications, we have principles flues. Uh, we also have, what is making that sound? Uh, we also have found uh, chorus reeds. Now, these are the kinds of reeds which you'd use within a chorus, within an ensemble. Uh, they're, used, they're reeds that you'd use to uh, thicken, for example, a, a principal chorus in this case. You already have... Which is a nice sound, but... Uh, when you want more, uh, a little bit more bite, you can add a, a chorus reed. And here we have the oboe, which is just French for oboe. That adds brightness. Uh, and we have here the trom uh, trompette harmonique. Uh, that's also a chorus reed. And we have the, the clairon. And that's very... You usually use all those together and you get... And, and, you know, when you're doing a uh, big chorale-like things, like um, something just... You have fanfares and that sort of thing, but there's actually special kinds of uh, reeds for that. Uh, you have chorus reeds, and then you have solo reeds. And the solo reeds are what you'd usually do, use for fanfare. And down here in the, uh, the solo division... I have all sorts of solo reeds. These are reeds which are meant to be used to uh, play a melody rather than to add sort of um, foundational breadth to a chorus. So you have the trumpet en chamade on very high pressure, and it's, it's really, really loud. And... And you use that for, for melodies most of the time. You do, you do um, I'm not having trouble thinking of a, of a melody now, but. And you know, that sort of thing. And then behind it, you'd have comping. And then, you know, something in the pedal to accompany me. Well, accompany me. Or maybe a uh, minor. That sort of thing. I mean, that would be rather inappropriate in that context. But you have these trumpet voluntaries that take advantage of that kind of read. Then you have a little bit more soft-spoken, the English horn. This is meant to imitate the sound of an orchestral English horn, and it's not as big or brassy as the 
uh, as the the solo read, the trumpet on Shamad, but it has a, a color and a character that wouldn't make it appropriate for use in chorus textures. Choruses are usually used for when you have a, a kind of uh, musical texture uh, similar to that of a chorale. These reeds are really meant, they scream for melody, like a clarinet or an English horn. Uh, that's the kind of number that you have, maybe underneath some very soft strings, right? You'd have something to this effect. You know, something, something very atmospheric. The organ is an incredibly atmospheric instrument, and it's so, capable of so much more than that sound that you typically expect out of an organ. And that brings us to our next classification, mixtures. I didn't explain these. There are stops that have, um, they have the indication of two feet in length, but they're not a single rank. A lot of these have multiple ranks. Um, and so usually on, on different organs in America and England, you'll see them uh, notated with a numeral, a Roman numeral or a, 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 an Arabic numeral. And usually, usually in America, if it's a Roman numeral, that's it. But uh, if you have an Arabic numeral, it's followed by either Fach or the small little F in German, which stands for Fach. And the Fach is just the German word for a rank. And so here, the Plan Jeu, I'm actually quite not sure how many ranks are in this, but... That isn't really used on its own. That's used on top of a principal chorus. So we have here, and then you add the, that gives you the shimmer. That's what you, that's what you think when you hear pipe organ. Uh, what, when you hear pipe organ, unfortunately, what you think is, I absolutely hate that. Um, but <laughs> that's what you think. So <laughs> essentially, yeah, uh, those, those mixtures are a collection of several ranks of tiny, tiny little pipes at different pitches that fill out the different harmonics. So if you hear it, this is not just playing one note. If you actually go all the way down here, there's a fifth in there and there's a third in there and you can make your own mixture. Um, no, okay, that's, I, that's too early. Uh, but you have different kinds of mixtures. And here you have one at one foot. Which is really, that's, that's a bit shrill here. As, as opposed to the, the plan jeu. Uh. And of course, you add mixtures, principal chorus, and then add the chorus reads, and you get... You get that sort of triumphant, triumphant, romantic sound, and this is, um, as I mentioned, it's an eclectic organ. These are the these are the tropes. I'm basically outlining all the tropes uh, that are observed in these kinds of eclectic instruments uh, all across the world. However, still very, very different. Um, this one has a sort of it's uh, it's an eclectic instrument. It's it's trying to imitate. Just think of it as a German person speaking in a French accent, or no, a German person speaking French, but they speak French in a German accent. That's essentially what this organ is doing. It's modeled after a French eclectic specification. However, the, the kinds of, of sounds, they derive from the German school of voicing, which is one which is rather, uh, puts a lot of emphasis on the higher notes, very shrill, screechy, uh, and very clear, very defined. There's not a lot of mush. You go to France, and those organs, um, it's like uh, gouache. Highest, lowest, would the highest, lowest notes be above, below, or at least close to the human hearing limit, considering, oh, well, yes, um, humans can actually hear a lot more than scientists give them credit for, because uh, quite frankly, I, I also the, uh, the uh, threshold of, what is it, something of uh, 20 hertz? 
uh, a human can't hear below that. I honestly think that's complete bull. That's the only reason they haven't been able to disprove that is because there's no, there were no subwoofers um, to actually go below that in a representative way. Uh, but now, today we have thick pin rotary subwoofers, which are capable of reproducing frequencies down to one hertz. And yes, you can feel one hertz. You don't hear it, you feel it. And I don't have a subwoofer here. And even if I did, you wouldn't be able to feel it over um, Discord. But when you're there in person, you have these ginormous 32-foot uh, pipes. And, and, and you hit the low C on one of those. It's, um, it's really, it's an effect. It, it, you, you feel it. Um, so, and, and especially those higher pipes. Also, I, I still don't think the, the upper range um, that's, that's really dependent on age and basically anyone's, uh, hearing limits, uh, that, that can really, oh, yay. Uh, he's here. Great. Um, oh yes. If, 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 well, if any of you do have Hauptwerk, this is a free sample set. Um, my Piotr Grabowski, it's a great, great instrument. Uh, but on, on that note, I also think high notes, uh, people can hear a lot better than what that approximation gives credit for. So uh, continuing on that, we have uh, on the subject of mixtures, mixtures are so high and addressing that if we started here, or sorry, if we started here, and we kept on going up, you wouldn't be able to hear those notes. Um, you know, it would quickly bust out of that, uh, that limit. So what mixtures do is they do something called breaking back. And um, you can hear the notes. So this, if this mixture, which sounds like there's three ranks of pipes, so for every note I hit on the keyboard, there's three pipes playing. Uh, whenever I hit... Here. There, around F and G, you hear a low pitch comes back in. And this is sort of like, you can think of it like a shepherd's tone because, um, not three. Must be some duplicates in there. Uh, but you can't, it's like a, it's like a, a music, it's a shepherd's tone is what it is. The organ really came up with that concept before other people did um, because you can get the illusion that it's ascending in pitch when really it's staying within the same register. Uh, here you have, you hear that low pitch come back? And it comes back, so it looks like it breaks back on the G. And so by doing this, it, effectively you, can, you, you won't run out of notes and it'll stay in the same register so that that way it's not as shrill um, when you're up here or when you're down here, it's pretty consistent. However, some mixtures, uh, such as this, it's a solo mixture called a cornet, um, that doesn't really break back. That is consistent. And as a result, it has a smaller range. So here, this cornet, if I play a, a low C, nothing will happen because it starts at the G, being consistent with the break back point of other mixtures. This is a mixture that you'd use um, uh, on its own. This is also a solo voice. And you'd use that with uh, accompaniment, um, usually either from f foundational stops from the great or foundational stops from the swell. Uh, and, and this one doesn't really break back. You can't... That one goes. That one goes all the way to to high C. It compensates by secretly moving parts of the note down again. Yes, yes, it does. Um, well, no, all mixtures. Well, most mixtures, as I said, will do that, um, and, and this one just doesn't. Uh, so that's why it has a smaller range because it's not meant to be used um, down here in the lower registers. It's for melody. Um, and then you have the sharf, which similarly, usually if you have two mixtures in a division, the breakback points will be at different notes to keep, to keep everything. So let me see. Yep. 
Yeah, so here it looks like looks like it's at D sharp. So we have the plongeu, which breaks back. That low note comes back down there at G, and over here at, at D sharp. And so by you, you would basically evade that, that issue uh, by breaking back. And so you use these mixtures on top of choruses. And as I explained, there's, uh, we have strings, uh, which are their own stop classification. And we have celestes, which are their own uh, independent stop. Now, you, you can't really use celestes um, alone. Celestes need to be used with another stop. And most people will say, oh, no, it's sacrilegious to use it with anything other than a string. Uh, and then, of course, you, it's, a, it's a duplicate of those kinds of pipes. They're just a little bit out of tune. Uh, and so some people even say, uh, for example, if I'm comparing the string, which can be found on this keyboard with the string that can be found here, and I say, well, I want to use this string Celeste with this, this division's native string. So I can essentially, going on to the next kind of classification, well, this is a bit uh, jumping, uh, there are couplers. That's another type of stop. That allows you to take sounds from one division of the organ uh, and, and move them onto another, make them playable on another division or another keyboard. So, and not every division has a keyboard. Um, no, couplers are physical stops. They're, if you consider, if your classification word for stop is a switch on the organ, I mean, a coupler is a stop. Um, uh, yeah, so... And so I can have that gamba, and by coupling it using here, this coupler, two to one, from the second division to the first division, I can get the celeste in the swell to come down with the string on the grade. And so that's very useful. Uh, however, many people would even say that's not, that shouldn't be allowed. I, however, I love using the Celeste with all sorts of kinds of uh, uh, other stops. I'd use the Celeste with maybe not the string, but the principle there is, it does, it's just not too useful. Um, the corno dolce is interesting because it, it's more of a flute up here in the upper register. Uh, but down here, it resembles more of a stringy principle. And so that's really great because you can use that to get a sort of different, that's a bit keen. The, the corno dolce, uh, it helps you get, get a more round sound. And uh, I like to use strings. This is, this is me being crazy, but I love using strings with the next kind of stop, or celestes, rather. Um, I like using them with mutations. And mutations are very interesting. Uh, they're, they're a kind of stop that does not sound at the unison. Like I explained before, when I pull an eight-foot stop, all that means is that the lowest pipe in that set is eight feet long. Same thing for four. Same thing for two. They're just octaves. But, you know, you have other pitches in between those, and you have other, you know, mathematical ratios and numbers. I, I remember SPO asking, well, why are there two and two-thirds? The reason for that is because the lowest pipe in that set is two and two-thirds feet long. Oh, no, I do have sub and super octave couplers. I'm just using the Hauptwerk master couplers. Um, I, I can explain that a little bit later, uh, but essentially this one, this is not a C, um, this is, this is a G. And actually this, this G is a G, which is two octaves above that of middle C. So whenever I pull a, a, a stop and the Nizard is a flute, <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah. So you have, uh, I think I'm the, I think I'm the lecturer here. Uh, but we have, now that fills in two octaves above the G, uh, with the eight foot stop and you get a really, really interesting sound. This is many, many mixtures, 
um, use these mutation pitches, as they're called, um, like the cornet, it uses these mutations. These mutations achieve a similar effect. And you have all sorts of types. So the Nizard is a flute which produces uh, a tone which is two octaves, uh, well, two octaves and a fifth, higher than the unison pitch at eight. So if I were to go, actually, this is a great example. That's an eight-foot flute, and if, I'm, if I go on the same eight-foot flute and I move up two octaves to a G, uh, a G, and then I hit that same C, but on the Nizard, we get that same exact G. But now we have it with the eight foot uh, down there. Uh, and then you don't only have um, Nizard at two and two thirds, you have one and three fifths. And that's not a fifth, that is uh, two octaves and, well, hold on, no, that's almost three and a, and a third. Uh, but tierce, you get the third. Uh, that's a really great sound. Uh, people say you shouldn't really use that with reeds uh, because um, those were initially meant to simulate the effect of a reed in a large chorus um, when they didn't have enough uh, wind pressure or, or money to afford or space reeds, really. Um, Yes, yes, you have sesquialtras. Um, so you have, and then you combine the two and two thirds with the one and three fifth. Uh, and then you get a, an octave higher. The one and one third is just the nizard at an octave higher. So it's, it's just more extremity. Uh, And that's called a larigo. And we have, if you combine all three, you get what is called a cornet. Right? And then we have, that's a, that's a bit uh, bolder. Uh, y yes, you, you build the native cornet within the, uh, within the division. Uh, the only reason you don't supply uh, a cornet stop is because you can build it. It's essentially just a composite of the different stops within that division, which creates the cornet effect. And then you have two separate ones that's really useful to have as uh, a foil. That concept of foils is very important in organ building. For example, you, you might be asking, well, I see here you have an eight foot principle here, and you also have an eight-foot principle here, why are you having a duplicate of the same stop? Well, the reason for that is because they're actually two independent, and this is not the case in theater organs, uh, which uh, implement something called unification, which I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, but here, there are two individual sets of pipes, and they're sort of voiced a bit differently. So the this, this swell, the swell principle, is of a different timbre and of, of a different scale uh, volume, uh, that is to say, than the great principle, which is a little bit more present. It's a, it's, it's a bit larger. Uh, and the reason for that is usually, uh, and this is actually Hauptwerk, um, that just means it's the great division. It's the main division. Uh, you usually have that uh, on, on German organs. It's the highest division. So you have those pipes up there, which are the highest. Uh, on American organs, the great is usually the pipes which are the closest to the, uh, to the listener. Uh, so that's, that's where you get, no, not really, it would be the central one. Well, of course, you have, um, on German organs, you'd have the root positive, which is behind the organist, and then Oberwerk. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, uh, the reason I'm not saying those is because I feel like they're rather jargonistic and uh, a little bit precocious and a little pretentious. Uh, it's it's you know linguistic linguistic uh, hobbyist garb. Uh, but the real the real important thing you need to understand is that the the pipes here are much much different. For example, they're designed so that they're sort of one to one of each other, uh, but they have different characters and different qualities in order to achieve um, in in different literature a kind of echo or um, what is it a reprise. What is it? Uh, recall, 
something that starts with an R. Um, but you have that same effect. Uh, for example, if I were to place here an eight foot principle, a four foot, and a two foot, uh, forgive my dog there, um, and I was, and I was to go up here, eight foot, four foot, two foot, those are clearly different. And if I were to, if I were to play, it's a sort of echo effect. Uh, and I use mixtures that, that, you know, it becomes even better. And, and you, you use that a lot in, a, in, in some resonance. Yeah, that, that's probably it. Uh, you use that a lot in, in early literature because that's how, um, before organs had all these sort of electrical contrivances that allowed the organist to change sounds on the fly, um, all, all you could do to change dynamic was to change stops, have someone be there changing these sounds for you, or to switch the different manuals. That's why you have different keyboards. We, the, it's not so we can play all the notes. Um, you don't necessarily play all three at the same time, although you can and you know, should because you paid for all three of them. I mean, it wouldn't make sense to not use all three at the same time at one point. Um, so you, you set up different sounds on these different keyboards and you can essentially, you can change between them and, and vary your dynamics. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, in this case, I did. Uh, but usually churches will... Um, essentially uh, buy the organ and rent it out to themselves every week. And that's how they pay for their organs. Um, but you have these foils, which are established in the different divisions, which are ascribed to different keyboards. Now, a division is, doesn't really talk about um, keyboards. A division, we're talking about a group of pipes that has been organized to be comprehensive within itself. The organ is a, the self-similar instrument. It's Every stop on this organ could be defined as an organ itself. If I were to simply have this one flute, um, for example, here, you know, and it, you, that, that, that itself is an organ. There are many one-stop organs with, you know, uh, a range of probably 56 keys or less, um, but that, that's an organ. And each division of the organ is an organ. And when you compile the divisions together, that in itself makes an organ. It's like, it's like the, um, the Mandelbrot set of, of musical instruments. Um, it's just, it keeps on expanding and compounding on itself, which I think is really great because you have a lot of organ music is self-similar. The fugue is a self-similar um, procedure. And, and of course the Pasacalia, that's ultimate self-similarity. Um, you, you find its roots in, in fractal geometry. Uh, well, usually, God, let me, let me do the lecturing. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have, you have here, all the divisions are ascribed to their own independent keyboard. However, divisions don't need to be, uh, don't need to have any particular keyboard. This is what we call a floating division. And these are divisions which exist within the organ and can be coupled using the same process of taking sounds from one division and moving it, making it playable on another keyboard or another division. Um, and, and it uses coupling to essentially move around whichever keyboard you want those sounds to be on. And it's, it's added flexibility. It's really useful musically. Uh, not all organs have this. However, um, some do. That is actually one of the greatest difficulties of writing for the organ, um, just not having any sort of standardization or idea of the capabilities of the instrument, which could range from you know having seven keyboards and uh, and a forty-two note pedal board with um, you know seven enclosures and and all sorts of stops and mutations and pitches to uh, one keyboard, no pedals and two stops. That's the difficulty. Uh, set up three one. Say we started at one. You use that for let's say half the song, and then it takes another turn. So you switch to two, and then for the end you can switch back. Um, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's typically what. Um, actually, I have an excerpt here, and I can demonstrate that for you. Uh, I also have prepared an excerpt where I can demonstrate 
combination action, which is probably the next thing I was going to talk about. Uh, couplers, tremulous. Oh, yes. Uh, quickie, tremulent, uh, varies the wind pressure and uh, makes the pipe go wah, 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 wah uh, here. Wah, 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 wah. They're not too exciting on classical organs, but uh, on theater organs, that's like the main thing because uh, they're much more pronounced and profound. Uh, however, I have an excerpt that demonstrates um, what you're talking about. And here, if I establish three to two, no, I want two to go to three. Here we go. And then I set up my principal chorus and I have a flute, okay, a couple of flutes here on the grate. I can start. You know, you get the idea. It just keeps on going of that. Um, messy. <laughs> uh, I, I, there's not too much manual changing in, in, in messy, but I do dabble. Uh. Uh, no, I've forgotten that, but um, <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, you get to the really fun part. Uh... <laughs> and then, of, of course, the part that everyone loves. to blow up my speakers there but uh i would have held it for longer usually you people hold that for uh, a couple of years before letting go on uh, traditional performance uh so you get that sort of uh <laughs> that was using what i'd call combination action and that's 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 a great thing to segue into um we have 
uh, on, on modern organs, I, I'm going to switch on to uh, on my alt. You can look at my stream or you can look at uh, here. I'm going to point out on the virtual organ, we have these things called uh, pistons. They're down here. On American organs, they're everywhere. And here, here's toe studs. These are just duplicates of these. And all that those buttons do, I'm going to turn on my, my video so that you can see my physical console. And, uh, oh, yay, 7%. Um, God, I don't want to end this early. Uh, I'm going to turn on my video. Here, you can see my physical console. And here I have an array. I have six pistons here, which I call generals. These, essentially, these are preset combinations that the organist can program. So instead of having to have someone pull out the, all the changes, you can make, make a change on the fly. If you want to go from really loud to really soft, in, like that, you can't really do that uh, very quickly on the organ. So you have these, and that controls which stops are in and which stops are out. And these control the stops for the entire organ. However, you have these pistons, which are divisionals, which control the stops in a set division. These are useful for if you want to change um, a stop, uh, stops on one kind of division, but you don't want to change them on another, and you really don't want to waste an entire general piston space. These are, these, uh, these are value saving, because these are very valuable. These are less, their value is not in that they are inherently valuable, their value is in that they allow you to conserve general combinations. However, I could program these to be generals if I wanted to. Uh, and down here, we have toe studs. These are basically like divisionals um, for the pedal. Actually, these are the pedal divisionals. Over here, these are duplicates of the generals. So they're duplicates of these up here. So if, I, if my hand isn't free, I can reach down with a foot and hit one of these. And the great thing about these is that since they're in sequence, I can set them, I can set them up. And I actually have a button here programmed. This piston right here that will go to the next one in the sequence. So I don't have to memorize, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. I can just hit the button next. So while I'm playing, uh, you always have to be ready for the next thing. That's everything, uh, finger-wise, uh, with, with pedal and foot position. But the primary thing is you need to be able to get your foot on the next button uh, in time to change that combination on the fly. So while, as you're playing, you'll move your foot over here and then play uh, next. And you see I have these set up in a specific sequence that allows me to, to play in a way which is a lot more nuanced. Uh, let's see here, anyone? Hittable? Yes, presets. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I think I want to switch into a, oh, great, 1%. Uh, hold on. Let me find a charger. I don't want to die on you all. Da -da -da. I'm going to take a little brief hiatus. All right. I'm going to uh, um, going to remove my headphones and here. Can you all, uh, let me place this. Can you all still hear me if I, if I move over here? All right, does the organ sound okay? Okay, wonderful. So. Great. Now. What I'm going to do, uh, Sawyer impulsively bought, uh, brought up the theater organ, so I think now would be a good time to, uh, after I get done explaining, I, I can explain combination action with these organs. Uh, so I'm going to load 
parallel with them. And I am going to explain combination action and then move on to unification, which is a different method of, of basically uh, organizing those pipes. So, yes, that's a massive organ. Uh, not all of it is completely functional, but we still have, uh, it's one of the largest instruments in the world still. However, we have this sort of separate kind of organ, uh, and this is later along in history. These organs were used to accompany silent movies, um, and the thing, the way that they developed uh, was by a British man by the name of, essentially, uh, Robert Hope Jones, and he developed this principle known as unification. And unification, what it did is it, instead of having a different set of pipes, where you see you have an eight foot flute, for example, let's say. Right? And um, so for an eight foot flute, you'd have that set of pipes, 61. And for a four foot flute, it would be a separate set of pipes. Um, you'd have a separate set of pipes for each. Um, but here in the theater organ, you don't, you, what you do is he reuses the same pipes for those, uh, for, those, for those notes. So everything is basically just shifted in a four foot stop, everything is shifted an octave up and he simply adds another, an, well really everything shifted an octave down if that's how you're thinking about it. Uh, but he adds another octave to the top. And so you have this eight foot flute and you get all the way up there. And when you put on the four foot version of the same flute, it just reuses those pipes for the other nodes. And you get an extra octave. That tip is a bit wonky, but you hear those are the new notes. Everything else is completely the same. So you can get the effect of having a large organ with limited ranks. And he actually does the same thing an octave below. So you have an eight foot stop here, and he has a 16 foot version of that that goes, he just adds 12 notes to the bottom of it. And you can't even hear that. But that's how, and so you have, this organ has what is called 10 ranks. So we have 10 ranks in this instrument. The previous organ you listened to had about 20 to 30 ranks. So, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure the tuba will sound all right though. special effects built into them uh, in order to accompany those silent films. So you have things like a <laughs> grand crash and, uh, oh, that's not gas, that's the sound of the blower. I can turn it off. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. There we go. See, and now it's gone. Uh, but that simulates the kind of noise that you hear. Uh, so the theater organs, the way that they're constructed is you have a limited number of ranks that have expanded octaves and those are used to account for the different, uh, essentially the different pitches of the same sound. So you have the same timbres, you have 10 timbres is what you have, and you have a sort of a nice array of pitches that you can use them at. Uh, and, and within these divisions, there's really technically only, there's, there's three pseudo divisions and there's two real divisions. So you have one division called the main chamber, and another division called the solo chamber. The solo chamber is filled with voices that you use uh, as, as a melody. However, you can control the, so the voices in the solo chamber from the, the keyboard that also controls the main chamber, and vice versa. You can control uh, pipes uh, from the main chamber on the solo chamber. That's why they're pseudo divisions. Everything is borrowed across divisions, making it accessible across different keyboards um, and, and it's not, it won't turn on. The reason that's useful 
here is, I'll give you an example. Notice how you have the eight foot tibia. That stop that I, I turned on right there on the screen. Um, I kind of forgot the metric combination action, but I'm pretty sure all of you uh, uh, understand that. So we have that tibia. That tibia is in the solo chamber. It is enclosed, what we'd say. The way organs get expression is we put them in boxes and they have shades on them, much like the shades on a, a window. And they open and close and they provide different volumes. So you have this little tibia here. I can play it down there. And if I turn on the tremulant, uh, that's, that's, that's the feeder organ sound there, a tibia in a box. There, um, you can control the volume of that by opening up the solo chamber, even though I'm playing it on the grate. Now you have three different divisions here. Um, you have on the console here. You have this is what called this is what's called the accompaniment, the grate, and the solo. You play the chords uh, chords over here on the accompaniment, bass and the pedal. Right. Is, um, is everyone back or are we still waiting on a couple of people? All right, great. So, wonderful. So uh, you can all see, I'm gonna to return to the tabs view and you can all see the, uh, yeah, sure, Sawyer, you can do that. Um, and what you just heard were the sounds of an American theater organ. And essentially what we're talking about is how those are constructed is fundamentally different from how classical organs are. Uh, because the way that these work is each rank uh, is, is present in multiple pseudo divisions, which can be accessed in very, uh, like I was saying, you have, if you remember what a rank is, it's a set of pipes and you have, here you have 10 different timbres. In other words, you have 10 sets of pipes. Now these pipes, they're not 61 note sets. A lot of them are, are 97 or, or 80 note sets. Uh, and the reason for that is because they have that extra octave on the top or extra octaves on the bottom. And in some cases they have, you know, an additional two octaves on top. So uh, what we have, is not only do we get here for the, the eight foot big flute, uh, which is called the tibia, tibia clausa on the theater organ. Um, and it really makes sense uh, when you put the tremulant and the tremulant on the theater organ, if you've uh, noticed, much more severe than the tremulant on classical organs. I, I, I rather like it a lot more. So you have that flute but that's one set of pipes. And using unification, we have available that same sound at eight foot pitch. We have that sound at four foot pitch. We have that sound at uh, two foot pitch. We have that sound at one foot pitch. And we also have that sound at every pitch in between. We have all the mutations. So we get uh, the tibia 
two and two thirds. We get the tibia tenth. We have some very interesting mutations. We have the quint, which plays literally a fifth above. I don't know, is anything coupled here? There we go. Um, we have this, this is a fifth. It's just playing at the fifth. And here we have uh, the tenth. And here we add the, uh, the tibia twelfth. That's, that's all uh, mutations, and you add in the eight foot. Nice rich chord. Um, the problem with this is that in classical organs, these mutations, they are tuned pure. Uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with tuning theory, uh, in 12 tone equal temperament, uh, nothing is really pure. Everything wobbles a little bit. Uh, oh, yes, Messiaen loves, loves mutations. Um, he uses them extensively. I, I'm pretty sure he'd love the theater organ because of that. But the, the problem with mutations on the theater organ is that in classical organs, since these are separate ranks, they're tuned. As I was saying, 12 tone equal temperament. A fifth um, is probably as pure as you get. Um, but theoretically, you shouldn't, have, uh, you shouldn't have any purity with that fifth. Everything should be equally dissonant. Everything should be should have just enough wobble. Everything is equally out of tune. It's it's not an exact ratio. And you have different temperaments. And I can actually show you an experiment with temperaments um, in this software. It's that powerful. It lets me show you um, here. Uh, but but since the the mutation pitches are being derived from the same rank, and that rank is tuned in twelve tone equal temperament, those mutations are not pure. On a classical organ, those mutations would, would be turned so that there's no beating in between those, uh, those two pitches. Um, that's one of the advantages of having a separate rank. However, uh, in theater organ, poor tuning is kind of, you know, a part of the charm of the instrument. And since it's everywhere due to unification, um, and especially with you with the trems on, nobody's, nobody's going to be like, oh, that's not a pure fifth. So it works just fine uh, with theater organs. However, um, let me demonstrate here with the, the diaphone. If, I'm, if I play a C, here, go to the console view. I'm playing a C. If I play the G above it, and I play them together, wow, wow, wow. it's a sort of, it's beating at one once per second. That's, and then if you go to any other pitch, C sharp, wow. Wow, wow. You have that same, it's beating at the same uh, frequency. Um, so I'm going to go up here into pitch and I'm going to demonstrate. Uh, I'm going to load a temperament and let's go into, for example, sixth, sixth, sixth comma mean tone, just to make a point here. Um, we have C, G. Hear how that's beating much, much faster? Because in mean tone, uh, we tune in thirds. So here the major third is going to be much more consonant, much more pure than it is uh, to the fifth in mean tone and to the, uh, the third in 12 tone equal temperament. See so yeah, how that's, it's tempered. It's not as pure. Uh, and then you get to, you, you get some, very interesting colors using these temperaments. And you really use this uh, in more historical uh, repertoire. Uh, but you, you really notice how that's, it's a little bit of wobbling. And then you go up. And that's completely unusable. That's it's borderline impossible to do, do anything with that. D sounds OK. D, D sharp is all right. E major. Ah, yes, that's. Just listen to that purity. See how there's virtually no beating. That is a pure minor third. Um, F is okay. F sharp is unusable. So now we have C sharp unusable. F sharp is unusable. G is okay. G sharp is just... Just listen to how fast that's going. Um, so it's that... When I, that's what I'm talking about when I say tuned pure. These mutations... Um, they're tuned in a way that they are, they're like this. 
They're like that minor third. They're completely pure. And then you come over here to the fifth, and that's that's closer to what you're going to get um, in in twelve tone equal temperament using unification. So we've covered that. Um, I didn't really go into a lot of depth with enclosures. So I think now would be a good time to continue. Do we have any questions? Yes. Fun facts. Um, so, so everything, everyone understands um, everything so far. Yep. Okay, great. Um, let's see. I'm going to check some messages here. Uh, more or less. Okay, great. Um, so this actually brings me to my next, uh, next classification of stops. We're still classifying stops here. Uh, so we talked about couplers, we talked about mixtures, we talked about uh, strings, celestes, foundations, reeds, uh, chorus reeds, solo reeds. Um, but now I want to talk to you about, uh, and of course, uh, sub and super octave couplers were mentioned. All that means here is, uh, especially these are very prominent uh, within a division. These couplers are used to couple a division to itself. Now I know that may sound... Um, a little bit weird, but remember the organ is the most self-similar instrument. Uh, here we have in the uh, the solo, which is the third uh, third manual or uh, third division up there. Uh, and let's say we put on the tibia. That's a nice flute. Now, if we wanted to couple it to itself, all we'd have to do is hit the supercoupler, and now we get not only the unison pitch, but the pitch of that same stop an octave higher. Classical organs also have these but um, not, as, not as frequently. They're more seen in symphonic instruments and, and they're, they're not really used uh, to too much a great extent. Uh, it's usually advised that you keep some sort of uh, purity to the chorus sound. Uh, those are really used when you just need to be louder and you have no more stops to add. Uh, here on theater organ, that is the exact same thing as adding uh, a forefoot. It's the exact same thing. However, if you don't have a stop at four foot pitch, say for example, here, the Vox, which you have at four foot down here, of course, it only it stops at the C because it doesn't have that extra octave. But you make, and down here, the clarinet is at 16, but it stops at low C because there's not the extra octave. But we still put them in those registers because the part in between is the most useful. So here, if we had a vox, and we wanted a four-foot vox humana, which is just human voice, it's actually quite iconic. You use it together with the tibia, and you, you use that with a tremulant, and you get, and that's the sort of theater organ sound that everyone associates with, um, with silent movie eras, or, I mean, if they associate any sound at all, um, silent movies were not silent. Uh, they're, they're pretty loud. <laughs> But if we wanted the four foot vox, all we would have to do is use the octave coupler. Now we have an eight and four foot vox. Now, if we wanted to get rid of the eight foot and we just wanted a four foot, then at that point, we'd need to use the unison off. And all that does is it just turns the unison register of that stop off. So now I have a, an eight foot vox with the unison off coupler and the octave coupler, and I have both of those pulled. And now we get a four foot vox. It was as if it's a four foot stop. And we can do the same thing for any stop on this division. For example, the flute. Right, that's a four foot flute. Here's the eight foot. And then if I pull the four foot on its own, over here, Do we have a four foot in the solo? No, we have a four foot down here. Uh, it's the exact same thing. Oh, yes, this is the Paramount 310, for those of you wondering. So we have, and this is free. All the ones I'm using are free. I'm poor, I don't have money to pay for commercial ones. Oh, um, try exiting and then rejoining. It's usually, it's usually a, a problem on on your side.
Yeah, well, can you still hear the organ, though? Okay, I think that's the most important. I'll just be a bit more clear. So, like I was saying, explaining, is we have an eight-foot flute, and that's one set of pipes at the eight-foot pitch, where if I hit low C, it's going to sound at... That's an eight-foot long pipe, and it's going to sound at low C, the same as it would in piano. Uh, where did you find that theater organ? Oh, this is the, ver this is the free Paramount 310 demo sample set. You can download it for free on uh, Paramount's website for Hauptwerk 5. Uh, so this is a 10-rank instrument, and you pay $99. They add an additional 10 ranks. So... We have here the eight-foot flute, and it's unified at four-foot pitch. So that means there's a separate tab on the organ that says uh, four-foot flute. And so I hit that tab, and all that does is it just moves everything down. It shifts it. It's playing the same pipes. They're not separate pipes. They're the same ones. They're a similar timbre, uh, but you're getting it at four-foot pitch. So there is some redundancy. For example, if you were to hit uh, an octave, with an eight-foot flute and a four-foot flute on a theater organ, that's only three pipes. And the reason for that is you're getting the octave here, and then you're getting another octave when you hit the octave above that, but there's a redundant note in there. So that doesn't get played. So you only have three pipes sounding. Um, and if I were to use the supercoupler on an eight-foot flute with the unison off, that's the exact same thing as having just a four-foot flute. And the great thing is that I not only have the same pipes, I don't have the four-foot flute only in the grate. I can use it in the grate. I can say, okay, I want an eight-foot eight foot flute on the middle manual. Right? And I can say, okay, um, now I want it to be on the third manual. Well, you can get that same exact flute. Oh, well, hold on on the bottom manual. Now, it's the same sound, uh, but the benefit to having the same sound duplexed, as it were, that's what it's called, to another pseudo division is you can have that play down here while having something else going on in the other manuals. And most of the pedal division, in fact, no, all of the pedal division is completely unified. The entirety of it. Uh, all of those stops are borrowed. So I can have uh, an eight-foot clarinet down in the pedal. Yes, yes, it's the 32-note AGO standard. So I can have uh, an eight-foot clarinet in the pedal, but that eight-foot clarinet is the same eight-foot clarinet that I can get down here on the accompaniment. And it's also the same clarinet that I can access in the grate. And it's the same exact clarinet I can get in the solo. So I have this, the same stop, the same pipe available to me independently uh, on each different manual. And this is really useful because I can make combinations uh, without uh, having to couple. Essentially, this allows you to free yourself from the contrivances of coupling a manual, which is you lose a little bit of independence. So yes, you can get that sound on another division, but unification is much more liberating because you can achieve that sound on another division without having to couple a manual. So that frees you up to set another kind of sound, another uh, type of tone on one manual while maintaining that sound on this manual. So it really makes really great use of each of those 10 ranks. If this was a classical organ, it would be tiny. It would not be, uh, it would be very underwhelming. Uh, but since it's unified and since you have these expanded ranks and they're unified at different pitches and duplexed across the entire organ, it's really, it's, it's basically an exercise in utility. Um, how much does one cost? I, uh, for those of you who are wondering, I think this would be a good time to turn on my video again uh, to, to display my organ console in a more complete light. What, what I did, uh, and this is on my account, here, what I did is I purchased an old analog Rogers organ console. And that console came already with the pedal board, and that had um, magnetic contacts uh, that were closed. And all, all of these had key contacts, and all I had to do 
is actually rewire them to some boards, which are back here. Those are the, the MIDI boards, which take the signal from uh, the key contacts from the 60s, which are, which are encapsulated, so they're uh, protected from dust. Um, and you also have the potentiometers, which I had to replace, uh, but I could wire these to work. So everything here, uh, everything here uh, was all analog technology. And actually, I have the original boards over here. Before I gutted this organ, this is how it operated. It operated using sine wave tone generations. And actually, uh, Sawyer, a classic fanatic, he has a, I, I don't know if I should have said his name, but um, he has a, an old Rogers organ, and it's a theater organ, and it functions upon a very similar technology. It's the same principle. Uh, and here I even have the draw knobs from the old organ. This is what it was filled with uh, before I had converted it. So it was a, it was a very American classic spec. These were lighted, so you'd pull it out and it'd turn on a light. On other organs, you can just uh, pull it out and it will physically um, move the stop outwards. But I added two touch screens and I'm running it on a virtual pipe organ software. And how that works, I could give you a whole lecture on this alone. Um, that's essentially you just take recordings of each and every single individual pipe in an organ and you compile them into what is known as a sample set playable in this software. And, uh, and it, let, it, it provides advanced audio routing applications for really complex audio setups. It allows for um, really specific um, keyboard configuration and uh, uh, pitch and, 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 and has built-in combination action and recording and to uh, buying a, an incredibly expensive digital organ for your house. Uh, those, those things are ridiculously overpriced. Uh, so... Uh, if you if you are considering composing or learning for the uh, learning the organ, you don't need this very fancy setup. All you need is to get the free version of this software. In fact, um, there's a free edition uh, of the version four, which I have in a Google Drive, and I will make available to all of you after this um, after this uh, presentation. And uh, and you can download that, and it comes already installed with this organ called Saint Anne's Mosley. And it's a great instrument for experimenting with, and there's plenty of free sample sets that you can download that I'm pretty sure will fit in that one gigabyte limit. The Paramount 310 also fits in that limit. So you can download that and install it, and it will work. Um, this is the organ that you get here when you uh, download Hopwork and open it for the first time. So this is a really great instrument. You can connect one keyboard and control all of the divisions if you wanted to. And you can experiment. This is a, a kind of sandbox. And this is really great for composers who want to uh, look at some of the capabilities of the organ. It's, it's, it's just enough uh, to, to help you get by. Uh, here we go. Oh, that's on the grate. You can have your trumpet, you have clarion, uh, you have your mixture, your flutes. And this is completely free. And so you can download this and, and experiment as a sandbox and use it to learn. Uh, and, and the more keyboards you have, the more you can get a feel for how, uh, how playable things would be uh, if you wrote them. And you can also uh, understand the capabilities of the instrument. This instrument allows you to, uh, you can have strings up here if you wanted to. And then down there, you could accompany with a really nice solo flute. And of course, I'm holding my phone here, but um, you get the idea. Of, of something like and then you put something in the pedal like a, a flute bass and a subas it's really really lovely for this um, so and if you want to pay for the full license and, and commercial sample sets and invest in like a really great audio system, it can sound absolutely incredible. Uh, so for those of you who are interested, it it's certainly sounds ap much, much better than any digital organ market-wise that you can, uh, that you can uh, buy just off the shelf. So that's a little bit about virtual pipe organs, uh, a little delineation. Uh, yeah, different MIDI channels. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, and yes, you can put MIDI files into Hauptwerk. In fact, if, if there's anyone interested, um, 
Yeah, I could probably just explain right now. Um, for those of you who are composers who want to put MIDI files into Hauptwerk for playback, there's a very, very simple way to do that. Um, if you write something uh, on an organ score, in view score, and play it, you're going to notice um, it doesn't work because Hauptwerk isn't magic, but there is a very easy, simple way to circumvent that, which is you write as if you, you uh, add three piano staves. So in your music software, add three staves uh, as if you had three pianos playing. And each one of those will be a separate MIDI channel. And so what you do is the pedal part, which the pedal here um, is only 30 notes, but on some modern uh, eclectic organs, it goes up to 32. So just stay within 30 notes in the regular bass register. It's, it's bass clef. So just write within regular bass clef and then you go down to the second stave. The second stave is the first manual up from the pedal or the grate. And then the very bottom stave, the third stave, is the uppermost manual. And that, and that is how you can write and arrange music for this organ. So if you wanted a melody, for example, on this oboe, but you, you, didn't, want, you didn't want the accompaniment or the pedal uh, to be played on this one manual, you would put the line, the oboe line, up here on the, or down on the bottom stave. And then you would have uh, your accompaniment down on the grate, and you could have your separate pedal line, which is the very upper stave. So it's sort of like an upside down score. And that's how you can configure it. And this is all free, new score is free. So you can write things and you can run them through uh, Hauptwerk's MIDI system. Actually, let me, let me show you. Uh, uh, where can you? Yeah, okay. Um, so if you go up here, in for those of you who might, who might be interested, um, you go into your large floating control panels, recorder player, you hit load, right? And then you can go down here, select your file. Let's say I wanted to do that. And then it's not going to register for you. You have to select the registrations. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to say I want a flute, a piccolo, and an eight-foot flute. Uh, and down here, I'm going to say I want these flutes. And I'm going to play. And then, so that's rather slow. So if you want, you can speed it up here. So you can speed it up uh, up to twice as fast. I don't think I want it that fast, but. So let's say that you, you were Ravel, but you didn't have the skills to play the music you wrote. Ravel did, but let's just say, um, and you wanted to try it out. You could essentially load MIDI files and play them through this software. So if it resets your registration, the reason for that is whenever you start a MIDI file, if it's not, uh, if it's not Hauptwerk, if it wasn't a MIDI file that was recorded in Hauptwerk, it will reset your registration because the MIDI information for that file does not include the MIDI information for each of the stops, which is completely different for every sample set. So I would simply uh, play it. It will reset your registration, pause it, set your registration, and then continue and, and resume. So that, that's an easy fix. For, for, what you're, for what you're talking about, if that's a problem you're having. So that's, so it kind of turned into a little VPO lecture there. Uh, still on the same line of thought. Uh, I think I should also probably, uh, you have these enclosures, and for some reason, I don't know why, they'll turn off my stops, but you can see here I have this, which is configured to be the swell pedal. Uh, and you can configure any number of things to be a, a, a pedal. You can have a volume knob or a slider, uh, or you could do it manually. So I have that. And all that does is, like, like as I said, uh, you can control the volume of, of, of those stops within that division. So the swell division is enclosed, and it's in a separate box. Uh, that's, that's what that means. So I can control the timbre and volume of those pipes in that division. However, the great division is unenclosed, so I can't do that for that. However, in some instruments, it is. Uh, in some instruments, it's not. 
uh, it's completely non-standardized. Uh, some, some instruments, like the Baroque ones, don't even have an expression shoe. They don't have any enclosures uh, because early on, that technology wasn't really available. So uh, let's see. I think I've, I've explained a lot of... Uh, I think I've explained... Uh, uh, quite a bit, so I think I'm going to open it up to questions uh, at any point um, about anything. If anyone has uh, some questions, I'd be more than happy to explain them in, in depth for you.